Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome everybody again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today who is helping and has helped to create a better tomorrow on many different fronts. Uh, we have the honor today of being joined by Colonel Vic Suarez, who currently serves as the Commander Chief Executive of the 6th Medical Logistics Man Management Center in Fort Detrick, Maryland. Uh, this is the United States Defense Department's only medical logistics management center, which is ready to deploy uh, both domestically and globally, uh, leading uh, with expertise in medical material, medical maintenance, satellite communications to, to fully support operational forces uh, on a variety of fronts in this area. Uh, prior to this role, Colonel Suarez played an extremely instrumental role as the program manager uh, for the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine as part of operation. Warp Speed, a uh, really unique whole of government public private partnership. Uh, which was responsible for delivering a, uh, a safe and effective SARS COVID vaccine uh, for the United States. Uh, Colonel Suarez has also served uh, as Assistant Chief of Staff for Logistics for the United States Army Regional Health Command Atlantic, uh, managing uh, healthcare, PPE, lab diagnostics, medical maintenance, uh, supply chain for 14 direct reporting medical treatment facilities. Uh, he was Chief of Staff of the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research uh, and was also Joint Product Manager manager uh, at something called JVAP, or the Joint Vaccine Acquisition Program, a uh, biodefense advanced development vaccine program. Uh, Colonel Suarez graduated from UCLA with a bachelor's in anthropology, holds a master's of science in health services administration, uh, as well as a senior service college fellow graduate certificate from George Washington University Milken School of Public Health. Uh, he is also defense acquisition level three certified in science and technology management, program management, and life cycle logistics defense at the, the defense acquisition Acquisition University. Uh, in addition to that, he's also a graduate of the Tufts CSDD, the Center for uh, uh, Study of Drug Development uh, in uh, areas like clinical pharmacology, drug development regulation, and the, uh, the Cornell University Pharmaceutical uh, Management Program. Uh, in addition to all that, uh, Colonel Suarez has served our country uh, in active military service, a broad span of assignments from airborne infantry, special ops, uh, mechanized infantry, and headquarters department of the Army, including two combat tours uh, as a forward support medical company commander and battalion level commander. We are extremely honored to have him. Uh, Colonel Vic Suarez, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. And obviously, thank you for your long service to our country. Well, Ira, thanks for inviting me today. It's, a, it's an honor to be with you today. I know it's been a, a while since we've initially talked about doing this, and I'm glad we're able to, to chat today for a little bit. What I wanted to just uh, share with you, Ira, is that any thoughts, opinions, or recommendations uh, during this talk are really on my own personal capacity and not officially representing the U.S. Army or the federal government's position. So I really appreciate uh, if you can just kind of put that in perspective for everybody that's listening to this podcast. We will do so. We'll do so. I have really looked forward to this. Um, you know, I, I, I spent a couple of minutes there reading through your, your extensive bio, but, you know, I'd like to start off uh, for a couple of minutes, like we usually do, just handing you the floor uh, to talk just a little bit more about uh, Colonel Vic Suarez. Can you, can you sort of little, take us into the background story a bit about everything from where you grew up, uh, obviously your interest in national service, but also uh, how you also develop these interests in the healthcare space. Tell us a little bit more about that, the Vic Suarez story, if you would. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Southern California. Prior to that, I was actually born in Saigon, Vietnam. My father um, is a former um, infantry officer, served a couple years in Vietnam. Uh, I grew up in Southern California for my formative years, went to school there all the way through undergrad. 
uh, I ended up having an interest in the health sciences, didn't know exactly which direction I'd go. Um, you know, it was a combination of public health, uh, potentially something in medicine or healthcare delivery, uh, could be in research, and I just wasn't sure about where I wanted to go. But I was also enrolled in Army ROTC at UCLA, and I played some sports as well. And I was, I was fortunate to get commissioned there as a medical service corps officer, and it gave me a broad opportunity uh, in my first 10 years of, of service, as you alluded to, to have a broad um, exposure to assignments in rapidly deployable tactical units and allowed me to deploy multiple times, not only in a combat environment, but also peacekeeping operations. Um, you know, I have a family, uh, two boys, one in high school, one in college. My wife's an Army Reserve um, colonel as well. And, um, and I enjoy things like road cycling, alpine skiing, traveling with my family. And I dabbled with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for a couple of years while I was in college. And then after that, while I was a junior officer in the Army. So that's a little bit about me. Um, but I'm, I'm really, uh, from a professional standpoint, I've been very fortunate in the last 10 or so years to, to really straddle between two fields that have uh, very strong connections, at least lately with the pandemic. And that's healthcare logistics and supply chain, and being an acquisition program manager, developing specifically um, vaccine products. Mm -hmm. And I found that the, those two fields um, were really uh, areas that I both have passions in and really, uh, really helped me to be kind of at the right place at the right time when, when the, you know, the country needed it. And I was just part of a, a bunch of people, several hundreds of people trying to, to do something to reverse the, the negative effects of this pandemic. And so that's a little bit about me. Outstanding, really outstanding. And, and, and you know, as you're just referring to Vic, you, um, alongside your service, you've developed sort of this broad, uh, increasing responsibility uh, throughout the, the Army uh, Materials Medical Command, uh, including um, time, as I mentioned in the intro, at this JVAP or Joint Product, uh, uh, Joint Vaccine Acquisition Program, part of sort of our United States broad uh, program on, on looking at chemical, biologic, even, even nuclear defense. Um, and, and sort of looking through your, your, your profile here of what you, I mean, you're really involved with the nasty stuff here. And I, I watch a little too much, uh, too many movies but obviously the uh, the character that comes to mind when I, it, it is the sort of you know, Dustin Hoffman character from the uh, the 1995 drama outbreak uh, a, a colonel right it, it, being sent off to uh, some faraway places to deal with some nasty bugs um, talk a little bit about this if you would and a little bit about your experiences here because you know there's obviously things like Ebola and Marburg and uh, Venezuela and equine encephalitis which you talked a little bit actually about on, on a previous show um, T take us a little bit into sort of your learnings from those days. We'll get into Operation Warp Speed in a bit, but, um, you know, was that that situation, you know, Colonel Suarez, I want you on the plane at 0300 and <laughs> sending you off to places you don't know where you're going, but to deal with some of the really nasty things that uh, cause us uh, trouble? <laughs> well, you know, thank goodness that the Defense Department has a, a chem biodefense program, and and really that that's derived from, you know, certain uh information we know about certain adversaries and the programs that they have to do harmful things to to humans and so i was very fortunate back in 2014 to be uh, selected to be the program manager the product manager for the joint vaccine acquisition program it's, it's an advanced development biodefense um, program and we had several um, you know products in our portfolio we also managed some licensed products in our portfolio for the defense department like the smallpox vaccine anthrax vaccine and I was really fortunate to have a great team there that, as a matter of fact, was really pulled into doing a lot of things on the pandemic response in the last couple of years. But, but when I was there, it was probably the first time I got exposure to rapidly accelerating a vaccine product um, very quickly. And that had to do with the Ebola outbreak. And so our, our organization back then, you know, partnered with a really a whole of government um, um, group of partners, not only with HHS, but with also the U.S. Army uh, Medical Research and Material Command at the time, and some of their subordinate labs that I would subsequently worked at later, like RARE, um, partners like you, Sam Ridd here at Fort Detrick. And that program, uh, in conjunction with the folks at DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, was able to rapidly identify a candidate vaccine for Ebola 
that is currently licensed right now with Merck and has been used several times in certain outbreaks within the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so our role in that was really to help advance, um, number one, the production of vaccine with DITRA um, that we, we did many uh, years ago. Uh, when there was not enough clinical trial material to go around beyond the phase one clinical trials. We needed to make sure that there was uh, enough material so that we can go into phase two and phase three clinical trials in West Africa, do things like ring vaccination trials, see if we can get an efficacy signal and possibly see if we could stunt the, the, um, you know, the progression of disease in West Africa and then prevent the spread uh, throughout the world. There was projections, if you remember, back in 2014 and early 2015 of potentially up to a million infections worldwide. And so we, in our program, as well as the Th Defense Re Threat Reduction Agency at the time, really exist to prevent and to control, mitigate some of the worst outcomes that could happen in humanity. And so we were always looking at worst case scenario, and we wanted to find out if there was a way to produce this material, get it in the hands uh, put money in locations uh, where we could do certain testing, whether it's animal testing at USAMRID, uh, making diagnostic assays to actually test the efficacy or the immunogenicity of the vaccine. And through investments that we did, plus with other partners in the federal government, you know, we were able to actually help, you know, get that vaccine deployed for phase two and three clinical trials and ring vaccination trials and really helped eventually Merck go to licensure in 2019. And that was a pretty rapid, you know, prior to, to Operation Warp Speed, four years or so, four and a half years was pretty fast for getting a, a candidate vaccine uh, to licensure. And that vaccine has been used multiple times to kind of stunt the proliferation of, of outbreaks within West Africa. And uh, so that was really my first exposure to kind of knowing a little bit about different ways, taking a little bit of calculated risks on how do we find the critical areas that we need to reduce some bureaucracy, put some effort in to help accelerate the advancement of a vaccine. And, and I think that experience really, you know, kind of shelved away for a couple of years, was able to be brought forward when I got called on to Operation Warp Speed. And so that was a really uh, great experience. It was a great team. And there's a really a good reason why the nation has the, the, the Joint Program Executive Office for Chem Bio and Radiological and Nuclear uh, Defense. It's, it's an absolutely essential program to the country. Absolutely. Absolutely, indeed. And um, now, you, know, you mentioned Operation Warp Speed. Um, now, a couple more years past JVAP. Uh, we, we get COVID on the scene. Um, the uh, the initial funding, and I, and I think, you know, the public knew too much about this, but we went up to about $18 billion originally, I guess, allocated through BARDA, which is another unique organization, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, part of HHS. Uh, you bring together uh, industry, uh, you bring together the military. Um, again, if you would mind, Vic, because this is a very important story, um, obviously we know why you were picked for this, <laughs> um, but but talk a little bit about the background here, um, sort of, um, when you were picked, uh, how, you know, you were decided, you know, you, Vic, you're going to go to Moderna <laughs> and you're going to speed things up there. And thank you, because I am a Moderna uh, uh, vaccinated person. Um, uh, take us a little through this, because once again, we we saw it on the news, but take us into a little bit of, of what you can tell us about uh, from the point that uh, Colonel Vic Suarez, oh, you're part of this and you got to make this vaccine happen. Right. So, in, when, when the outbreak started to kind of really affect the country with a lot of the shutdowns in March, I was currently assigned to Regional Health Command Atlantic as their, you know, I was what they call the G4, Chief, uh, you know, Assistant Chief of Staff for Logistics. So in a, in a normal large medical system, it'd be like the, the director of supply chain for a, a large health system. And at the time, for the first two or three months with my team, we were trying to just ensure the continuity of healthcare delivery, right, with PPE and all those things you mentioned. And then what happened was, is we got into um, late May, early June, we had really um, gotten to a good place as far as getting a handle of converting the chaos into some, some type of order in the Regional Health Command. And it was at that time that all of a sudden I got the call in June uh, and I had, you know, I got a call from a, an 06 colonel. Uh, I knew Operation Warp Speed had been announced. Um, 
And I got a call from this colonel that I didn't know. And he said, hey, um, you, you've been selected to go to Operation Warp Speed. And I said, you know, I think it was like on a Friday. And, and, he's, uh, and I said, so when do I need to show up? And he says, um, what about Monday? <laughs> and I was already assigned to another place at Fort Belvoir. I was kind of involved in that. I thought I was going to be in that job for about a year. And, and literally, I had a couple of working days to report. And it, all I was told was that I was going to be a vaccine program manager. And so I started doing some research about, hey, what are the vaccine candidates? You know, at this time, I'm, I'm focused on getting lab diagnostic equipment. I'm getting viral transport media. I'm trying to distribute PPE across a bunch of different states uh, in our healthcare system. And I'm now kind of converting back really, really quickly back into advanced development. So I had to turn that kind of mindset back into, you know, okay, well, I'm going to go back into biotech development type stuff. And so... When I got to the organization, you know, we were in the Hubert Humphreys building in uh, downtown, mostly out of the seventh floor um, down in Washington, D.C. And, and, and I knew some of the players that were there. Um, some of them had already gone before me. There was another officer that was our operations officer that, at Regional Health Command Atlantic that got pulled about two or three weeks before me. And a lot of the colonels that were brought there were trying to help the senior staff kind of build the organizational structure. Mm -hmm. And they were at the same time rapidly trying to recruit the, the members of the team. And so from what I understand, you know, General Perna got pretty much carte blanche. Whoever he, could, he wanted, he can get on the team. And so what I found out subsequently is it didn't matter if you were in command. It didn't matter if you were across the country or another country. If your name got nominated and you got screened and selected, you were you were pretty much going to this organization, and they were looking for skill sets um, other than just vaccine program managers. That was my background uh, before of why I got pulled in, uh, I believe, and and also my experience at JVAP. But there were people that got pulled into this assignment that had really strong background in operation systems analyst work, like like ORSA type people, data analytics folks people that had strong, uh, deep knowledge and experience at the senior level. So people that have been over 20 years in, in their careers uh, to be specialists in certain areas. And so I didn't have much time. I originally went there and I looked at um, the portfolio and I was, you know, my experience told me like, hey, my experience was to, to maybe be a PM for one of the, the teams that um, were aligned to a, one of the bigger companies. So you know, that, that's where I was comfortable. My bias was, you know, a lot of the, you know, those companies that had previous experience with getting vaccines to licensure really had the best shot at doing this. And I, I had really a hesitation with some of the smaller companies. Uh, but uh, there was a, a senior leader there that was in charge of vaccine development who said, hey, uh, Vic, we want you to go on the Moderna team. Um, and at first I, I really didn't know much about Moderna. I just heard that, you know, you know, I, I heard of them. Um, they were in the news quite a bit. They were making some, you know, bold statements and, you know, they were a relatively small company, you know, less than a thousand employees. They were really a clinical stage, uh, company that had real, no, no commercial, uh, products, um, nothing ever approved. And so I was really hesitant, um, going to a team, um, that had that product, but I tell you, um, after getting to meet the, the team that was pretty much uh, staff from BARDA and interagency, but also meeting with the Moderna team, after about a week or two, my mind completely, I think, changed when I, when I read a lot of the, the information, the pharmacy manual, how, you know, the manufacturing process, and really the, the technology itself, and kind of got to meet the people, because that's the other aspect that I was able to compare with previous experiences working with smaller companies. And there was just a distinct difference when working with this team, not only at the BARDA, HHS, and CDC people that were matrix to this program, product coordination team, but when I got to meet the people at Moderna, um, it was just a refreshing um, kind of culture and attitude that I felt that after about two weeks, that this, this this organization actually had a very good chance in doing what they ultimately did by the end of the year. So that was kind of my little story of how I got assigned there. And uh, I, I just started running right away after I, I first checked in. 
Well, it, it turned out extremely successful. Uh, Vic, obviously in the name of Operation Warp Speed, uh, it, it implies, uh, as we all know from our science fiction uh, uh, watching, that uh, there's a, a bending of time involved in traveling uh, <laughs> across the cosmos. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the things that we may be in the public here a little less uh, aware of per Operation Warp Speed that really helped you bend some of those timelines to speed up the development of these important bioproducts. Yeah, Ira, thanks for asking about that. You know, I think in the public, we've heard about, you know, we've done things in parallel and, and some of the, the things that we did as far as, you know, trying to gain some speed uh, over development. What I wanted to share with you in, in the audience is some of the, the very specific things that I could highlight that maybe some po folks weren't, um, uh, don't really have a background in like why these were able to get us more time. Um, without sacrificing safety or efficacy of the development of the vaccines and therapeutics. So, so first and foremost, um, it was absolutely critical for us to use the Defense Production Act to get both the research and development and the manufacturing supply contracts priority rated. That is absolutely fundamental to scaling up the manufacturing of vaccine, as well as access to key raw materials, pieces of equipment, and in anything associated with producing any of the vaccines or therapeutics. By, by getting that priority rating, uh, which is we call a DO rating, uh, we were able to award letters uh, to various manufacturers, in this case with the Moderna product coordination team, they were the first organization to get one. And for being a small company, you can imagine they're in the normal marketplace would be nowhere in priority or allocation for any of these key raw materials. But because the, the government was able to award those priority rated contracts, they were instantly able to go to the front of the line to get key, uh, key materials to scale up manufacturing. So that's number one, an absolutely critical program. I think anybody that is looking at doing something enormous uh, needs to study up on the defense priorities and allocation system. It's really a, a program that is administered by the, the, the Commerce Department, but is is day-to-day -day given authorities to the Defense Department and also Health and Human Services for health priority resource and allocation system. So there's, there's actually two aspects that the DOD and HHS can actually implement under the defense priority and allocation system. The second one that a lot of people don't know about was, you know, you heard about all the clinical trials, especially the large phase three clinical trials. We would not have been able to do or include as many clinical trial sites that we actually had in the program unless we expanded the footprint of a lot of the clinical trial sites. What a lot of people don't realize is that some of the sites that we had were not conducive to having a lot of people off the street, if you will, to come in during an active pandemic and to be screened and to be brought in for the various visits required in a phase three clinical trial. So what we did was we actually leveraged a wartime capability called log cap within Army Material Command. And this is just think of a big contract that's like an exigency contract. In time of war, you could go to another country and basically build base camps and dining facilities and all these things right away with these large uh, industrial based contracts. We were able to uh, leverage a contract like that and use that domestically to build out uh, clinical trial site uh, trailers and additional footprint at clinical trial sites that were limited in size and they could not take on the volume of people that were to be enrolled in these large phase three clinical trials. That, in, that allowed us just in the Moderna trial to include about 20 additional sites across the country, which was absolutely critical for a couple of reasons. One, we got more sites in different parts of the, the country where we can recruit a more diverse population. That's one. And two, it protected the workforce, right? These are people that we had no protections against these people other than PPE. And so if we created trailers that could screen people outside of the main clinic, we would be able to have ways to actually um, have them do follow-up visits without having to have people come into the building unnecessarily. And we were able to roll out these, you know, these clinical trial um, site trailers very quickly using the Army Material Command and the log cap contract all over the country. And we set up hundreds of these places all over the country. 
Third thing was a new agency under Homeland Defense called uh, CISAR, the Critical Infrastructure and Security Agency. This agency, I'm telling you, this is probably a, an organization that most people in the country have never heard about. These are the quiet professionals that make things happen in the background that you would never think about, right? When we had a, when we had a, a, a requirement to load or to have a, a, an air handling system, we're talking an industrial grade air handling system, go on top of one of our manufacturing site um, rooftops. And there was a defined you know, plan within our schedule we could not get permission from various states to travel on a Saturday and Sunday to go on the, the, the highways because there was a wide load. This thing had like a 14 foot load, had to have escorts. It was coming from the Midwest of the United States. And there was a big traffic jam somewhere in the country. And this, this delivery was going to happen on a Sunday versus like a Friday. And one of the things that we weren't willing to do is we weren't going to sacrifice one day on the schedule. We weren't not going to slip. So we just called up CISA. This was like in the evening on a Friday night. And within minutes, th this organization had contacted multiple state police departments, governor's offices, and they had arranged for escorting this shipment through multiple highway systems across a couple states that weren't going to allow them to drive on a Saturday and Sunday <laughs> and make sure we had delivery over the weekend. And so all we had to do is call this team that was that they had a cell assigned to warp speed and they literally called everybody that they needed to do to include like state police superintendents and said, this is a national emergency. We need you to provide escort and meet these trucks at this at your border stop and bring them in all the way into Massachusetts. So that's another thing that people don't realize. And that same team when we had a, an accident with one of the FedEx trucks for a critical part to go into a manufacturing site, it was in a major accident and the, and the, and the truck was um, impounded in one of those lots. <laughs> and, and because there was a death in this accident, uh, we, we, they were originally told that we couldn't get access to this truck for, for weeks because there was an investigation and this was a part that was coming from another country and we needed the part to install to actually make, you know, manufacturing run. And this agency got in touch with the local authorities there, said this is a national emergency. Uh, we had the, the, the benefit of having one of our, the carriers, I believe it was FedEx, who had a manager that worked after hours. He said, I'll meet the team there. They went into the impound lot in the middle of the night and they went through the wreckage and they actually pulled this critical part out. <laughs> and they got it and they hand delivered it to our manufacturing site. Those are the little things that, that, that would delay the schedule by sometimes days or weeks. And our thinking was, we're not going to slip one hour. We're not going to slip one day. And we had an agency like CISA basically um, making all this stuff happen behind the scenes. And it was just absolutely amazing. The next thing is really how the organization was structured. Okay. If you look at Operation Warp Speed, I know if people Google the organizational structure, Stat News, I believe, put out like a, like a bootleg version of our organizational structure. I would tell you that that structure, although it looks very confusing, it is, was very flat. Even though we had a four-star and very senior people in the organization, this organization was flat. And due to that flatness, allowed us to make decisions very quickly mm -hmm. and we could have access to all the senior leaders really quickly. And I will tell you that um, how that your organization is um, organized and the people you select in it can make the very big difference on how quickly you can go. And another unsung, you know, an other unknown thing is we had an army of very capable analysts and consultants that we were able to bring in that had deep extra expertise in various fields. And that allowed a lot of us in like key positions to actually go faster because we had a, an army of analysts and consultants that can quickly analyze data, infuse them into charts that we could brief uh, by providing little, little guidance. And I will tell you that by bringing in capable consultants and experts in certain fields allows the leaders, whether you're a program manager or a product coordination team lead or you're the clinical trials um, lead, 
allows you to go faster and work more efficiently during the day. So those are just some of the highlights that I would share with you that a lot of people uh, may not be aware of. Really, really awesome part of the story, Vic. Really, really cool stuff. And, you know, quite recently, and, and, and actually quite recently after you, you joined uh, Operation Warp Speed and, and, and were successful, um, you, you gave a, a presentation uh, at the uh, Association for Healthcare Research and Material Management, part of the American Hospital Association Conference. Uh, it was you and I as a, and it, at, from Moderna, who you worked together closely with. Uh, presentation was entitled, Lessons in Public-Private Partnerships to Rapidly Develop and Deliver COVID-19 Vaccine. Um, Anyway, think about public-private partnerships. Obviously, we, uh, we we don't have, well, I don't think of them too well. I mean, I think obviously on one hand, we have a lot of work, for instance, it happens at the, uh, say, the NIH, and then that work is transferred to the drug company, which works on something for X many years, and then finally delivers a product. In this case, obviously, uh, you're working hand in glove. Um, Walk us through a little bit. I, I, in this presentation, you, know, you focused on uh, and not just the lessons for how a successful public-private partnership should work uh, in something where we have an extreme unmet medical need, but also the qualities of the people that you want on that private-public uh, partnership team. Talk a little bit some of the learnings in terms of uh, the general structure uh, uh, of a private-public partnership in this particular context. Right. I, I think this is really kind of the, the big takeaway is, is really what are the, the key elements of a successful public-private partnership. And I've talked about in, in other talks I've had um, that this is not only applicable at the national level for these kind of grand projects. And if you look at the history of our country in just the last century, right, Operation Warp Speed really just is, is an example of our latest grand project. Right. If you look at the history of, of the Panama Canal, the national highway uh, uh, system, mm -hmm. uh, eradicating smallpox, or even the Manhattan Project, um, these are all grand projects that required really unifying elements uh, of a public-private partnership. And in this case, you know, the federal government uh, could not do this without the, the, the private sector and the private sector uh, would have a very difficult time doing this without the public sector. And so some of the, I think, key guiding principles that uh, Hamilton and I talked about at a, at a conference we spoke at last August in, um, in Nashville was one, in order to have it, the, one of the first things is there needs to be an understanding of a shared vision of a short, a midterm, and a long-term idea of, of shared success there with what that vision is. In the case of COVID-19 vaccine, that short-term uh, goal of success was an, a, a, some type of an emergency authorization or licensure of a product that could be approved by the FDA that was safe and effective. The, mid, the midterm goal was rapidly distributing and getting that administered in as many arms as possible in the United States and then the world. And then third, the long-term one is really unleashing the power of this new platform technology and other platform technologies for all the other pathogens that we could use as platform technology to prevent or mitigate future pandemics. So what I would say is, is that if we understand that there's a short, mid, and long-term vision out there, it's much easier when you have day-to-day -day disagreements about one, you know, one thing here, one thing there in the contract, when you understand what our long-term vision is, our midterm and our short-term, it's easier to form a team that can be more transparent. You can develop better trust because you, you have in mind what it is in the long run you want to do, right? So you serve, that serves as a foundation. And I think that's very important to any public-private partnership. That needs to be defined and understood amongst the partners uh, right at the front, mm -hmm. forefront, right? The second thing that is really, I think, indicative of the successful public-private partnership is each of the partners need to recognize their roles and focus on doing what they do best. Mm -hmm. In this case, the private industry, they're really good at innovation. They can take calculated risks on certain things, but then there's certain things that they can't do, right? Uh, they have the flexibility to to to, to adjust things and acquire things. 
but there are limits on what they can do based on laws, regulatory issues. And so the government's role in this case is to identify the things that we do well, which is policy, regulations, laws, whatever it is to reduce the burden and the bureaucracy on the private partner that is trying to achieve a certain goal. And I think it's very important that we focus on those areas that we do well and then have an understanding of staying in those lanes so that we can better mutually support each other. I think the next thing is we need to spend more time in these, these public-private partnerships and focus more of our time in the transformational efforts, like those things that are going to be um, evolving, that, that, are, that require dynamic changes and rethinking of how we do things than the transactional. And the transactional is like the day-to-day -day checklist of things, you know. Um, obviously, we need to have a schedule. We need to have a checklist. And we need to have, you know, certain things that we, we inspect or we, we oversee from a contractual basis. But if the transactional becomes our overwhelming priority in our day-to-day -day efforts, we get so mired in the bureaucracy of that, we never actually get back to our, our vision of what we want to actually make happen. And so it's really about balancing and managing your, your efforts and your resources towards transformational efforts and change versus just the, the nitnoid transactional. And that's another principle that we try to uh, influence within this, you know, the product coordination team uh, with Moderna and with, you know, with all the teammates that we had on the government side. I think that was really, um, those are the kind of the, the, the key principles that we believe were very, that led to some of the successes we were able to do um, in about a 10 month period. And, and Vic, talk then a little bit also then about the leadership traits, because obviously um, you need certain, I, I see the the biotech space, uh, pharma space, say I, I, I spent a lot of my career in it. Um, yeah, we do a lot of really cool stuff, but there's a lot of really risk averse people there that saying why you shouldn't do certain things and why things should take uh, 20 years as opposed to only 15 and so forth. Um, obviously you need a unique characteristics to, uh, to do some of the things that you're talking about uh, in these public-private partnerships as a leader. It's, talk about some of what you learned on that front as well. Right, I agree. Um, I think some of the things that I, I would talk about in this space is, is one, it goes, goes back to the risk aversion for, for these grand type of projects that have a lot of uncertainty there, right? And uncertainty is just really another word for risk, yeah. is you, you need a certain amount of people that are, that are really bold leaders that are able to take calculated risks. So these aren't people that are cavalier with taking their risks. They, they, have, they have measured calculated risk-taking efforts, and they have really a reason behind why they're doing certain things. Those are the kind of people you want to recruit within this space or anything that's going to require something that's, that requires a lot of transformational leadership uh, to, to create something that maybe doesn't exist before. The next thing I think you need is you really need a, a pretty resilient group of workers. Um, we're talking about people that that have a lot in the tank, right? These are people that have a, a lot of built up ability to absorb the a, enormous amount of workload that they're gonna undertake. So I would never recruit in somebody uh, into a project like this that had a lot of uh, personal challenges going on in their life, right? I mean, th that's gonna happen, but that's not the person at the time to bring into a project like this when you're expected to sometimes work 15 to 17 hour days, because you're just going to burn people out. And so resiliency and, and having people that have a deep reserve of the ability to handle a lot of workload and to, and, and then know how to manage their personal and professional lives. So, and we used to talk about in our team, at least on the government side, about getting enough sleep, fitting in time for exercise, nutrition, all these things that when you're doing something very stressful, you have to make sure you make time to do to take care of yourself mm -hmm. uh, in order to absorb the amount of workload and stress that you're going to endure over this, this period. And so for the military side, a lot of it, a lot of us look at this like it's just another combat deployment. Yep. And so most of the people that assigned to war speed had already been deployed multiple times in very challenging conditions. And so when we got assigned to warp speed, 
we just felt like we were on a, on a deployment, even though we might've gone home every night and, you know, we're with our families, as far as our families knew, or as far as our day-to-day mindset, we were at war Mm -hmm. and we were at war with a virus. And then that's how kind of our mentality was set up. And I think a lot of the, the partners on the private side and the public side felt that they were in that same mindset. And, and when you're in that mindset, it's easier to kind of prioritize what you need to do um, and, and really focus on the mission. Mm-hmm. At the same time, we, we still have to remind our people to take care of yourself and your families as well. And I think the third thing that was really, really helpful, and I saw this with the, the senior leadership, and, and I, would, I would even say you, we saw this at the four-star level and even um, you know, at the senior civilian level, was an inclusive kind of mindset when it came to decision-making. And I, and I think that was something that was remarkable for those people that were internal on the team, was that if you were in a meeting, even with General Perner or Monsef, um, at some point, you know, they might share what their initial thoughts were on something, but they welcome debate. They welcomed a different way of looking at things. They welcome when people would challenge them on their initial assumptions. And oftentimes it was because of that environment that was set up, that inclusive environment where people, even lower ranking people could speak up and say, Hey, um, this is some information I have. This is what I recommend. And this is why that was accepted. Those people were not shut down. They were actually listened to. And I think that makes a huge difference when you're doing something that requires this amount of effort and risk-taking was, was you needed an environment where inclusivity and people's voices could be heard, even if they were lower on the, the, um, the food chain. Um, and, and several times the pushback actually had the senior leaders actually change their minds and actually go in a different direction, which I found to be refreshing. And, and I think that's another kind of lesson learned here about the types of not only people you have, but the environment you set up and the kind of the ground rules for dialogue. Excellent. Vic, you know, you, you mentioned, um, you know, I was just part of that sort of uh, healthcare care or sort of the daily wellness, both, both physically and mentally. I know that uh, in our discussions offline and also I, and I've watched some presentations of yours in the past, I think when you were at the GW, uh, talking about your, your own interest in sort of uh, human health, human enhancement. Um, obviously, this is a, uh, a very important topic from, a, from the perspective of uh, our military, not just for the, the care you know, before, during and after uh, battle, uh, let's say, but also in general. I mean, uh, broad possibilities for uh, lots of what, you know, once again, I'll put in this basket of unmet uh, health and unmet medical needs that we as a society deal with, whether it's Alzheimer's disease, cancers, heart disease, what have you. Um, you're, you're leading the, the, the six medical logistics management centers I mentioned at the beginning now. Talk about some of your other interests, because I know they're, you know, they're quite broad. Uh, take us a little bit of what some of your interest in the area of, of human enhancement, human possibility are, and some of the things you're interested in, in, in doing uh, specifically in this area, if you will. Sure. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm passionate about human health and what the potentials are with, with how humans can increase the quality of life. I think this is an important, and I think I, I can tie this to even um, some of the you know, the things we've been dealing with in our country in the pandemic, also with military readiness. Um, and, and so this is an area where, you know, uh, for the year I was a research fellow at GW School of Public Health um, as part of an Army War College fellow there, I was able to actually do a research project uh, for the U.S. Army on looking at different ways and means that we can improve the readiness of our force and improve kind of not only just the, the medical readiness per se, that's kind of the, the checklist aspect of, of the military's medical readiness, but really how do we actually get to the point where we can have people achieve their optimal health and really how, how can they find ways to, um, to really better pursue a longer and, and higher quality of life? So this is an area that I've been fascinated with years. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of some of the talks that the current Surgeon General had um, when he was in the job last time about you know healthy aging. Um, I'm a big fan of some of the um, scientists that are out there, like mm-hmm. David Sinclair at Harvard, that talks about you know slowing down the aging process and some of the other um, prominent folks in this field. 
And I think when it, when it comes back to, you know, the, the things that I think that um, we could have m- maybe more of a conversation about is kind of looking at our healthcare system in areas where it's designed to not really have people be as interested in their, in their own human health potential. I, I would mm-hmm. like to see a system where people are more curious about how they can be part of uh, improving their own personal health. And, and conversations that can sp- start that. Cause I truly believe that health is not just a consumption thing. It's not just something, a commodity we, we buy through health insurance or mm-hmm. only can get when we go to the doctor, but I'd like to see the conversation shift a little bit more to how we can see health as, son- uh, uh, as a, as a, uh, as a means of something we can actually produce, mm-hmm. right? Something that we can actually um, build upon, not just only preserve. Right. And so you take, the 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 uh, the model of you know you look at professional athletes or those that are like even you know masters athletes right they're not in just the the mode of only just trying to maintain what they have but what they're actually in the business is of actually trying to produce health right yep. to actually get better numbers as far as their their biomarkers and and certain things that they 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 feel better about themselves they they actually can actually live longer and actually enjoy life a little bit more. Um, I, I think we need to have more of a conversation in that. I think one of the things that I, I you know, came, I'm, I'm an advocate for is more use and more research and implementation of health risk assessments within our model of healthcare delivery. I don't think that we do enough about um, really measuring our health risks in a way uh, where people as really patients understand where their health risks are and where they are, where there's potential for them to actually improve. And I think by not really seeing that on a regular basis, uh, most of us are just kind of in the dark on that, right? And we don't have a, another form to compare against people that are, are, are within our, our peer group. You know, if you're a 35-year-old male or female, you should know where your, your numbers are as far as all your biomarkers and your health status compared to people of your peer group. So you get an idea of kind of where you're at. And then specifically within the various domains of your health, are you at high risk? Are you at medium risk? Or are you at low risk? Hopefully in some type of graduated, you know, quantitative scale on a health risk assessment that's hopefully validated by NCQA, that's been tested thousands and thousands of times. So it's pretty darn accurate because it's got hundreds of thousands of people that it's, it's referencing, you know, health outcomes based on behavior and certain biomarkers. I don't think we have enough of that within our health system. And I think if we do, if we are able to shape the conversation more to that, then I think what ends up happening over time is that we become more interested in being part of the equation. And I, and so the other part of me that says, you know, is into the biotech and, and the development of, of technology, I think technology alone can't solve everything. Mm-hmm. And I think part of the equation is we as individual humans need to also meet the technology halfway. We have an obligation. And I think by doing that over time, we can actually improve uh, human health from a large population standpoint and eventually get to the point where um, things that we, we deem are challenges today are going to be no longer challenges, or at least we delay the morbidity status and we com- or the, the, the um, morbidity status and we, we can get to the point where we can compress the morbidity status in, our, in, our, in humans. So instead of, you know, in the last 20 years of life being inside and outside of a hospital and having a lot of pain, uh, <laughs> we could pretty much get to a point where a good number of our, our humans can actually die peacefully in their sleep in their 90s, maybe even hundreds, and, and, and do it uh, all within a short period of time, um, you know, maybe getting sick and not being in and out of the hospital. And so that's kind of where I'm a big fan of, of, of really is the idea of comp- compressed morbidity yeah. and how do we get there. Yeah, that, uh, that, that, that whole health span uh, concept has been very hot lately, and it's, uh, it's clearly an area that uh, uh, we're going to be seeing a lot more of. I'm, 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 the, I'm in complete agreement with you on that. Um, you know, it, it, got, it got me thinking a bit, um, because 
you know, I've, I've had the opportunity over the last couple of years to do several shows with, with folks from DARPA um, and the, and for our listener, the, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which uh, is, is pretty, you know, a, a lot like a, a public-private partnership in a way that you have, you know, these really great people in, in the Defense Department, but working uh, with partners and so forth, some really cutting edge stuff in terms of spinal cord injuries and epigenetics and all the types of things you were mentioning. Um, and it got me just the thing because, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago, the, the president announced this uh, ARPA-H uh, project, which is going to be sort of our DARPA for health in the United States and taking sort of these big risks, as, as you've been talking about in health. And once again, whether that's Alzheimer's or cancer, whatever. Um, I'm just interested because, it, it, you know, there's been a little debate going on. I've seen in the news, you know, that, that this ARPA-H thing, you know, some people want to run it like DARPA, uh, really a lot of risk taking. Uh, uh, and some of them put, put it in the NIH where things happen maybe a little slower. Um, if the president was to call you tomorrow and say, here, Vic, you got to set this thing up for us. Um, how, how would you model something like an ARPA-H uh, to, to take care of some of these other issues that we have coming our way, whether it's a tsunami of Alzheimer's disease or uh, the cancers that we're, we're not dealing that well with yet uh, and so forth? What are your thoughts on ARPA-H? Yeah, so what I'd say in general is that I'm not, I'm not opposed to the idea, especially these grand projects to get after things that really we've had under investments and in, in projects against. What I would say is, and I go back to some of the grand projects that our country has um, dealt with. Mm -hmm. If you look back in the history of the grand projects, just about nine out of 10 of them or so had some type of military element to them. Yep. And the reason why I think that many of them were successful is because of the military aspect to them. And it's not because the NIH is not capable of doing it. I would just tell you that there are certain there are certain things that we in the military uh, are trained to do. We are leader developed since we were you know junior officers for twenty some odd years throughout our careers to um, to lead people and to oversee projects that are that have great stakes in them. And I think part of it is is that I think we would have to be careful that we're not. You know, redundant in some of our efforts between maybe what DARPA is doing mm -hmm. and what ARPA, you know, this other project is doing. But I think it's a it's a good step in the direction of trying to create infrastructure that's focused on an area. So, for example, you know, the the, the president's national COVID nineteen preparedness plan, you know, creates now a institutionalized uh, version of what we had with Operation Warp Speed. It turned into the CAG, and then now it's called H Core. Mm -hmm. I think. I think any time where we try to institutionalize something where there's an unmet need makes sense, but I think the organizational structure is the, the absolute key of how uh, successful it's going to be. And what I would recommend is that there's going to be some element of the Defense Department in there uh, to, to have some type of bold leadership mm -hmm. that is really apolitical, um, that is not focused on interagency politics, you know, little p. Um, that that is mission focused, mission driven, no egos, and really focused on getting the mission done. Now, there's a whole bunch of ways you can structure it, but one one method that I've seen work is you can have a day to day operation to kind of keep uh, the warm base and really do some transformational things. But when something as enormous as a worldwide pandemic or some other disaster hits its way, you probably want to have the ability to bring in some heavy hitter leaders that are hand selected at the national level to come in and actually lead the organization that have been clearly vetted, you know, like your general Pernas and your Monsefs. Those are the kind of people that probably need to come in during a, a, a national crisis. It doesn't mean that you can't have an organization day to day being run by a very capable staff and senior uh, personnel. But I think it's 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 wise to leave open the ability to bring in you know nominated hand selected leaders for something of national importance um, that we need to do. I think also this type of a program would benefit by having maybe rotations of officers from the not only the U.S. Public Health Service but also from the military to come in as fellows on a rotational basis, so that you have now a stable group of officers. Uh, not only in the U.S. Public Health Service, but throughout the different branches of the military, 
that have experience of rotating through there at different grades and levels of experience so that when a national emergency does happen, you have all these people in a, in a quick Rolodex that you can bring into the program that already have had one or two year assignments there as, as fellows or as you know one year assigned detailed people. I think that's an important thing to structure it. Um, and so that's kind of the general uh, kind of initial thinking I, I would have is do, mm -hmm. not, do not discount the role the military could play in, in, into a project like this. Um, it's just, um, it's the mindset and the culture that I think it's going to lend itself to really doing um, high risk, high reward events. And we have uh, decades of, of results. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I appreciate your insight on that. I, um, I, I figured, you know, <laughs> with your long expertise at the intersection of all these programs, um, you'd, you'd be able to give us a really good lay of land on that. And, and I really appreciate that feedback. Um, Vic, obviously, you know, you've had this fascinating uh, journey to date. Uh, you've met many fascinating people along the journey. Talk a little bit about some of the mentors, if you would, uh, that you've had along the way that have kept you on this path, uh, as well as some of the people that you've mentored, um, because it is obviously, as you've mentioned, it's, it's a major team effort. Talk a little bit about mentors, if you would. So Ira, I think one of the, the things that, you know, for folks that, that have had opportunities like me to be in successive leadership positions and uh, positions of responsibility, it, it, it doesn't come without a lot of uh, intentional mentorship. I've been very fortunate for um, over 20 years to have been mentored by uh, people that have had extensive experiences, not only in the military, but also in the private sector. And I will tell you that um, I think that part of what I really enjoy about being mentored by folks that have had extensive um, background in the biotech industry, as well as uh, some of them are general officers in the military or senior officers in the military is the opportunity to give back. And that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned out of this is that I personally um, try to seek out and mentor as many up and coming uh, civilians uh, that are researchers, program managers, and also military uh, NCOs or officers. I think one of the most uh, rewarding aspects of being a senior leader um, is is really um, helping people see opportunities that they never thought they were going to have and encouraging them and staying in touch with them and opening opportunities for them to succeed in their careers. Um, I've, I've you know been fortunate to help even non-commissioned officers get into medical school or um, encourage a couple ones that I have right now to, to uh, pursue um, terminal degrees, a doctorate program, a doctor of physical therapy. Um, there is nothing more rewarding, in my opinion, for a senior leader than to build that bench and to see that bench grow. Because there's a certain point that some of us um, that are in these positions are going to have to rotate our, out of these positions and mm -hmm. move on. And so it's really our obligation, in my opinion, to, to grow that bench. And I think this is a key aspect of anybody that's looking for um, successive roles and responsibilities is mentorship absolutely has to be a big part of that. I think there's a strong desire within the scientific world uh, for a yearning for mentorship. And, and, I, and I encourage anybody that's working in any of the STEM fields to make that a part, a major part of their, of their daily priorities is to continue to mentor people and develop organizations where mentorship and growth opportunities are always prioritized. Um, and I, I will tell you, this is probably a key aspect of, of why I think I'm in certain positions that I've, I've been able to have is just, just due to that mentorship. And, um, and I think that, that would be one key lesson that I would share with anybody uh, that, that's pursuing anything that's of, of any challenge. Outstanding. Vic, what's uh, what's coming up next? I mean, obviously, uh, you were at the 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 HA Healthcare Conference. Uh, are there other places that the, the public can see you? I obviously can't come visit you at Fort Detrick, but um, other things that are begun coming up in 2022 that you can talk about. Uh, any other conferences you're going to be at? Uh, talks you're going to be giving. So recently, I, I was just at uh, the World Vaccine Congress 22. Uh, okay. That was just about a week ago. 
uh, down in Washington, D.C. That was the first time in three years we, we assembled almost 2,000 people from the world to talk about, you know, vaccine development. And it was just, it was just an amazing experience to, to be there. I wasn't a speaker at this event. Okay. Um, I was in a lot of the talks. Um, it was great to see a lot of friends and colleagues, you know, advance the science, talk about um, some of their work throughout, you know, industry and the government. Um, kind of the next kind of engagement I'm going to be speaking at is, uh, is a symposium in North Carolina on the 8th and 9th of June. It's a North Carolina state level. Um, I guess it's, it's kind of promoting the medical biomedical industry within the state of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And um, several of us military leaders were invited to be speakers or panelists um, there on the 8th and 9th of June in, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And then right now, I, I know I'm, I'm speaking at least twice at the ARM 22. Um, that's the Association uh, for Healthcare Resource and Material Managers. Managers. It's a, it's an organization under the American Hospital Association that runs an annual conference. That one's in Anaheim in August, and I'm going to be speaking there about setting up, um, you know, kind of lessons on setting up a medical logistics crisis action team. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about my organization, the Six Medical Logistics Management Center there as well within the DOD track. So I have one track talk I have to the general population, mostly civilian healthcare supply chain directors and people in the civilian healthcare supply chain business. And then um, also we have a DOD track there in, um, in August as well. So that's kind of the next couple uh, speaking engagements I have. And, um, you know, so... That's kind of what we have for the next couple of months. Awesome, outstanding, um, Vic. I mean, it's a it's a fascinating story, a fascinating journey you've been on. Um, I take my hat off to everything you you've been doing. Uh, I want to continue to follow you and, and watch you progress through all these important programs uh, because it's it's doing so much to uh, to benefit uh, society. We're not just here in the U.S. but around the world. Um, and, and I really wish you the best with all of it. Um, for, for everybody that uh, is going to be listening to this particular podcast uh, across the various uh, networks or watching on the YouTube channel, again, you've been spending time with Colonel Victor Suarez, Commander, Chief Executive of the 6th Medical Logistic Management Center, Fort Detrick, Maryland. Uh, Vic, I want to thank you again for taking the time to, out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while and educate us on everything you've been up to. Obviously, thank you for doing it and thank you for your long service to our country. And as we like to say on this show, uh, thanks for helping to make a better tomorrow for all of us via what you've been up to. It's a really wonderful story. Thank you, Ira. It's been an honor to be with you this afternoon and uh, really appreciate it. And I wanted to just emphasize, you know, all the projects I've been on, it's all, it's all about teams and it's, it's about forming that team. And there's hundreds of people that were involved in, in some of the projects that we worked on at Operation Warp Speed and even going back to the Ebola outbreak and, and trying to rapidly accelerate a, a vaccine candidate against Ebola, it's been hundreds of people in the background. I've been honored to be, you know, in these positions during these times of crisis. And uh, it's, it's, I learned so much from working on teams and really helping develop and lead teams. But it's really a team effort in this endeavor. Got it. Got it. Well, it was an honor to be able to profile you and really appreciate it. All right. Be well, Vic. Good seeing you. Good seeing you.